the Christine Klassen Gallery. Um, I think it goes without saying to maybe just bear with us. This is our first live stream ever. Um, we've got Rick Dukeman and Heather Close joining us today for a little informal Q&A um, to talk about their work. And, you know, we're also, you know, answering any questions that you may have that you can kind of leave in the comments as well. Um, but we're gonna, you know, cover a lot of territory in this half hour segment and we hope you enjoy it. Like I said, just bear with us. Um, so of course, people who don't know me, I'm Christine Klassen um, and Candace Larson, who is our framer extraordinaire here at the gallery. And she's also going to help me mediate the discussion today. Um, we've also got here Heather. Heather Close is an emerging artist based in Calgary. And this series of work is a hopeful and unexpected amalgamation of plants and organisms. Um, these works, she says, are a love letter to the resiliency and vulnerability of nature and an exploration of the abundance of organic life. Um, she holds a BFA with distinction from the Alberta College of Art and Design, which is now, of course, UA Arts. Um, and Heather, if you don't mind giving us a, a little introduction. Yeah, so as Christine says, I'm an artist based in Calgary and I graduated from ACAD, which is AU Arts now, in 2009 with a major in painting. Um, and thank you so much, Christine, for putting this together and creating kind of a, a virtual way of us sharing our work. Um, and hello to everyone joining us. Well, thanks, Heather. Um, and now I'll introduce Rick. Sorry if I'm turning to the side. I just want to make sure <laughs> for my husband that the volume levels and everything are okay. Um, so I'll introduce Rick. Rick Dukeman is a Cochrane-based artist with a BVA from the University of Alberta and an MBA from the Golden Gate University in San Francisco, California. He has been making a drawing or making drawings for most of his life, but has only recently returned to art as a full-time pursuit after retiring from a 30-year career in finance. Um, Rick, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit to everybody? Hi, I love art. <laughs> um, I was happy enough and lucky enough to have a, a wage-earning career while I found out what I wanted to do with my art, and now I'm showing for the first time and. Uh, this is a dream come true. If I sound nervous, it's because uh, I have to pinch myself to think that a good gallery is in, interested in my stuff. We're happy to have it. Yeah, exactly. Don't be so modest. They're great drawings. Mm -hmm. I know. Um, and I think like, just as a, a further little introduction, um, the discussion today is kind of in response to the Papyromania show that um, we have kind of on at the gallery right now, um, which is a, a show that's, well, quite frankly, about works on paper. Um, and both Heather, oh, Rick? Uh, I'm getting messages that people aren't getting on. Jan no, they're not uh, getting on. Janice, could you try to come in through Chrome? Yeah, I was gonna I, say, I think we do have some people who are who are linking? So, mm -hmm. if you sorry, we'll just see. We'll just see what happens. We'll keep going, and we'll see what happens. Um, so back to what I was saying about the paper show. Um, it's a group exhibition, but we are specifically featuring kind of these new bodies of work by both Rick and Heather um, because they are exciting bodies of work, and I really liked kind of what they were doing with the with the medium. Um, so we'll do, we have a few little technical glitches maybe to iron out, but what we are going to do now is bring in a screen that is a little bit of a walkthrough of Heather's show. Um, and we'll you know, have a little bit of commentary about it as it rolls through. It's, it's not very long, it's a little under two minutes. I'll just bring it in now. All right, so. Oops, I'm just gonna turn the volume off. So I really particularly like these two because the, the color of the paper choice is so interesting to me. Um, and then of course we have another favorite, which is one of the few black and white mm -hmm. ones, which I have a few questions about later. Anyone else feel free to pipe in, otherwise I'm just gonna bossy <clears throat> in. 
these are quite lovely too with this kind of peachy paper yeah have the reviews shown there before i have yeah um, we've had Heather sculpture pieces yeah yeah we had a sculpture show for heather a couple of years ago okay. um she's working on these yeah th which is a continuation of that body of work which again we'll kind of talk about further in the q a mm -hmm. we framed a couple and i should explain we did frame a couple of these pieces um to show how they could be framed the rest i kind of just pinned up onto the wall um Framing is such a personal choice. Yeah, there's so it's so particular. We wanted to give the clients a choice, show the work the way they want to sort of see it and enjoy it. So yeah, we have kind of a combination of these these smaller colored pieces, and then um, these other ones which are kind of all on 15 by 20 inch pieces of paper. Heather, so what, now I'm kind of what kind of back. paper do you? Sorry. What's that, Rick? What kind of paper do you use? Uh, all types of paper. I think I use Strathmore the most, but it's kind of, I go, f I'm still experimenting with what I like. So I use different types every time I go to it. Yeah. Where do you get your paper? Oh, various art stores. I usually go to Kensington Art Supply, which is now not in Kensington, but um, they have a good selection. And what about oh. the super textural paper? Yeah, did um, you make that paper? and the burgundy and the green. I didn't make that paper, although I feel like um, in the future it might be something that I kind of delve into is making my own paper for works. Um, I kind of I found this package of uh, colored handmade paper and found it quite interesting. Um, and I don't know why, but I started the series with those pieces. Um, oh, okay. It was kind of a, a ch like a fun challenge to see what colors showed up and worked on the different uh, pigmented papers. So, um, yeah, it was. I just found it kind of like an interesting way of of uh, diving back into painting. Are you painting or using um, uh, uh, pens or combination? Uh, it's all it's all paint, uh, gouache, and ink for these pieces. Mm -hmm. Lots okay. of buckling. Um, sometimes, yeah. I've I'm learning more and more about that process. So, yeah. Bear with me. And the paper does seem quite thick, so it does kind of resist that. So I think that that was a really nice choice. Yeah. 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 And unfortunately, due to a few technical issues, I don't have the walkthrough of Rick's show, but. Um, but we will be discussing a number of his pieces kind of later on and I have some still images of those pieces that we can we can chat about. So sorry, Rick, do better next time. Always um, growing, always learning. Yeah. I, well, that's just it and it's the first one. So we'll highlight some on Instagram going forward as well. Um, so, I mean, I guess, the point of this too is obviously we want, we'd rather have you all come into the gallery and see the shows, but it's just not possible right now. That said, we um, are offering kind of a, you know, safe and sanitized uh, visits, like private viewings of the gallery if people would like to come down and see the shows. Um, alternately, we do have some other videos and images posted on our website as well, just as another resource. Um, and you know, and this is a hard thing because galleries are meeting places for you know other creatives and for the community at large. And so, with the pandemic, we're we have to adapt to kind of changing times and trying to learn new technology on the fly. So um, we thought maybe trying this live stream would be a good way to kind of reach out um, and connect with our community um, and also get these two this two beautiful bodies of work out into the world so that people can see them because you know candace and i still get to see them every day but <laughs> not everyone else has that that privilege but i do want to put it out that that we are offering like i said a safe and you know sanitized gallery visits for anybody who's interested um one other things um i wanted to talk about was was that you know it's also really important to kind of support artists um, and local businesses right now, um, and not even just galleries, but 
Um, but obviously we would, you know, love to have your business as well. We still are kind of fully functioning as a frame shop and we are selling art both through our kind of buy art section on our website, as well as just through our website in general. If people have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, we can be connected by email, the phone, or even through social media. Um, let's see. What else was I gonna say? I was gonna talk about the huge learning curve. I think I've kind of touched on that. So I do look forward to kind of hearing everybody's feedback. Of course we know we'll be able to make this better down the road. Um, and we just really appreciate anybody who's tuned in. Um, without further ado, I think we can move into kind of the more Q&A portion of the Q&A. Um, I've got some questions, I guess, that I want to put out there to both artists. If you could kind of alternate back and forth answering. And then I have some questions on specific pieces of work for you both. So I'm gonna kind of open it up. Like I said, I'll ask questions that if you both like to comment on, or maybe you don't, but um, I guess one of the first things I wanna ask about is for you both just to kind of tell us a little bit about these bodies of work. Um, Rick, do you wanna start by kind of talking about this body of work? Sure. It it started from as young as I can remember. I would even go on drives with my family and I'd be drawing. And it, that just carried on. Uh, decided to go to the Alberta College of Art and I had two years in one year there and just enjoyed drawing with color. Then at the University of Alberta, uh, they, they taught me color and they introduced me to modernism. I thought that modernism and postmodernism uh, was really cool. And uh, so, so I bought in, but the limitations were that you needed a studio, you needed trucks, you needed crates, you needed this, that, and the other. And as my art emerged, I found that portable was the future. So what's right. going on right now uh, sort of is something I imagined would happen, but I started thinking about it in the 70s, that we would be going smaller, we'd be going portable, because people are on the move. Uh, right. right. That's so, a good point, because they are, thought, right? they are a delicate kind of size, which, I, which is what I kind of was attracted to about them, is, you know, in a, in a time where a lot of people are going to such kind of a large scale painting and even large scale drawing. I, I love the, you know, the kind of like intimacy of some of these drawings that are literally like three inches square. Um, <laughs> so I think it's just a kind of a refreshing, you know, take on drawing. Heather, and what about you? Tell me about the, your, bo the, your body of work. Well, uh, this body of work is a, a bit of an extension from my past work. Um, it's just more expanding upon the nature portion of it. Mm -hmm. um, but this body is, to me, is about uh, hopefulness and resiliency and also the vulnerability of nature. Um, this is the first painting series I've done in a while, so it was kind of nice to dive back into painting. Um, I'm interested in painting in, in plants and their ability to transform uh, ruin and destruction through decay and regrowth. Right. Uh, this particular body of work speaks to collaboration in the face of anxiety and uncertainty. So just, I guess, very apt to the time that we're in right now. Yeah, no, they are. No, they're lovely. And um, we'll bring up some images again, um, kind of, as we kind of focus more on questions for Heather. Another question, um, again, if you could kind of both like short, you know, give a kind of the short answer for is kind of what is your inspiration? So Heather, we'll start with you. What like, I mean, your plants, but are there particular artists or, you know, even like music or what, you know, or, or is it just plants in general? Like you're saying it is a love letter. Is there particular types of plants? Yeah, some of it is um, just, I spend a lot of time outdoors. So um, some of it is just because I love being in nature. Um, mm -hmm. I also am really interested in botanical illustrations. Uh, and so those okay. have been a great um, inspiration to me. Um, well, you I definitely see that reference in your work. 
Yeah, and and I also watched uh, like Blue Planet and things, and then just get really nice. uh, nerdily excited about um, undersea plants as well. Um, okay. Yeah, so I feel like it's just um, the environment around me that just makes me excited about it, and then I want to paint it. So yeah. And Rick, what about you? Like, what is what is your inspiration? Everything. Sort of flip, but uh, I reflect a lot when I when I do my works. They they started off with, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, I would be doodling in in a statistics class, and I'd say, "Gee, the drawing's wrong on this. What are they trying to tell me?" And so some of those. For example, those dotted pictures right. involved statistics. Other times, uh, on the personal side, one time Laura was having a bad time, and so that one picture you did show originally was out of a series that I called Tears for Laura. They became uh, planets as I was thinking about an uh, uh, introduction I had to a fellow who who worked at NASA. And so the, the tears became planets in space. And then, then the next ones, I would just start with something and I would react to them. So I each picture is about something. Thank you. That's very interesting. And so my next question is a little bit more timely because of course we're only doing this, you know, live stream because we can't have artist talks at the gallery right now. Um, so maybe if you could each talk about kind of how, um, you know, the pandemic has kind of impacted your life, how it has also impacted, like, how you make art during this time. Rick, if you want to start off with this. Well, it made some of those pictures timely because I was looking at, believe it or not, uh, concepts around, around large data and how we use it. And the, the dots were, were just just that dots on paper and then the way the pandemic grew um, um, it's it sort of it made those pictures relevant in that it gave them a different context so others uh, other pieces would be uh, just thoughts that I'm having as I create of course it's at the back of your mind every day uh, and you try to uh, to deal with it and and one way is to to be overwhelmed by it and to see life as, yeah, there's an example there. <clears throat> yeah, I figured I might as well bring up some visuals <laughs> besides our beautiful yeah. faces. Yeah, uh, statistics become geometry, point line shape, uh, three dimensions, time, and then back to shape, point, line. And so the elements of art are there, but there are also the elements of everything from math to to uh, how we approach thinking in logic. Other right. pieces can be just emotional. Well, and are you still, because you're pretty prolific, so you've still been doing quite a bit of drawing during this time. Would you say you're doing more drawing during the pandemic or less, or how has it affected your practice? Uh, I, I'm an artist, uh, by, and I call it by profession, by commitment. So there are times when I don't feel like getting out of bed, just like everybody. Right. And so uh, what I've done, and it's not just pandemic, it's, it's with my personal life too, is I drag myself out of bed every day and uh, go through my preparations, feed the dogs, send them out, and then go downstairs and just start. And so I've got, right now, I've probably got 40 pieces in various right. stages. Wow. And uh, if I finish two a day off, I'm really lucky. Right. That's, right? Still, that's still very impressive. Mm -hmm. I mean, Heather, maybe you can also speak to, and I'll bring up one of your images here in a second, but you know, maybe you can kind of speak to um, you know, how the pandemic has affected your practice. Um, yeah, so it's been productive in some ways. Uh, I've started some some new projects, but I'm definitely working slower than usual. I find it a little bit harder to get into the mindset that I need to be in to make work. 
Um, part of that is because the area where I make work is now my home office. So right. <laughs> it's like an all in one. Yeah. There's a little bit of a, sh a shift there for sure. Um, but yeah, I've, it's still been uh, making work and thinking about work. And I think it's kind of reformed the way that I think about my work. Um, so we'll see what, what happens with that. <laughs> Look at your line work. Those are those. Those are like feathers on top. They're that, they're actually very neat. fine line work. They look very feather like, for sure. And the way you've modeled the color. I really love the color in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really fun. Thank did you have fun when you made this? I did. Yeah, I have. I have fun making the work because I never know what they're going to end up like. So, it's. Did you ever? Did you ever study Eve Tange? The Canadian wow. who used to do those kind of uh, surrealistic underwater scapes. Oh no, I have not. I've oh okay, because oh, those are reminiscent of his stuff. I'm I, I was a big Eve Ten gay guy. Yeah, yeah. One last question though, before we kind of move on to, you know, the more individual, like before we kind of split to just asking some specific questions about Heather's work and then Rick's, is I want to pose this last question to you, which is why paper? So Heather, why paper? Um, well, the last I, work, body of work we had was sculpture. So this is quite <laughs> a departure from that. And especially with painting, it could be on canvas, it could be on board, but you made the choice to put these on paper. Tell me about that. I think part of it was going from sculpture back to painting and uh, paper's really accessible. It's right there, uh, cool. you can start doing something. But then I also really liked the texture and the feel of paper. And I ended up really loving the, the pigments and the colors that I could get from watercolor and gouache. Right. Um, and so I found that the paper really worked well with that. And also paper kind of lends well to the themes I'm working with as well. Like being working with natural paper just kind of seems to make sense. Well, that's a, that's a very interesting connection too, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Rick, what about yourself? Like why paper? love it um a lot of a lot of things some of them are logistical uh as you know when when we were going to put the show together um and you asked to see as much as you could i i thought i had maybe 50 100 pieces and then just because of the way this stuff stacks right you you work one and you you put it on the stack well this is done or put it over here and then the stacks came up and counted 500 of them. Right. Uh, I could move an entire show, Not which I lie, did. Honestly, no lie. There were literally bags and bags of drawings. <laughs> and thanks, Candace. About what was it two years ago when I when I went mm. to meet Laura? Uh, I, I did a tour of the United pieces. States yeah. and, and you framed up some pieces. It was sort of our introduction. To my work. seat in the truck. And I, I gave them to from everything from a guy who I wish would be here, uh, Phil Tompkins in Denver, and his and a firefighter guy who was a, a friend of the family. And, and I, it was just, we had shows in, in restaurants, never met these people before, and here go, comes an art show in paper. You can't do that with a 20-foot canvas. Right. You can't do it. And so, so it was like, and, and I thank a professor, Dave Cantine, for giving me the idea about this portability. The other right. thing is paper is very much a, a product of, of now, right? Uh, I use a minimal amount of, of material per per emotion. Each one each, each piece is an emotion. So I get to say my piece and not try to overwhelm my viewer with it. These are just sweet little little okay. hi how are you and hey that reminds me of a story thing so uh paper is really really appropriate for me the feel is great and the other part yeah, is think of them as sort of very very yeah. in a, uh, sorry sorry that's so okay we're gonna do some talking they go into a, a shredder really easily it's not the end of the world if you say uh i'm stuck if i keep this i'm never gonna get out so off go 10 pieces. Uh, Easy more. to edit the body of work. 
Laura took exception to that because I took down a show and I shredded the entire thing in an evening. And it was like, okay, <laughs> no way, if I don't do this, I can't get, carry on. Sorry, Heather. Well, well, that makes sense to kind of, to be a good self editor of your own work too, right? And you're right, it's not as, it's not as dear to shred a piece of paper than it is to, you know, destroy a canvas. Um, so now I'm going to kind of move into, I guess, more some individual questions for each of you. Um, so Heather, we'll start with you. I'm just going to bring up one of your images here. Um, but while I, you know, while I bring up the image, I'll pose the first question, which is, are the plants that you're using for inspiration, are they real? Or are they fictionalized or embellished in any way? I would say they're a little bit of everything. So some okay. are straight from references, straight from actual photographs, and some I've kind of uh, taken liberties with to uh, make up. And some of them are are just altered versions of, uh, and some of them are sorry, some of them are actually completely made up. Okay, okay. I kind of wonder because, you know, some of them kind of resemble, like you know, in the the image we have on screen now too. Like it does kind of resemble a poppy. Um, you know, but I just wonder, like, is it actually popular? Are you taking some, you know, creative license, I guess? Is it more it? about also the shape as well? Like making it a bit more seductive. Yeah, it is about it is about the shape and kind of playing with that. Like, so actually referencing the poppy, but also in scale with this, it becomes not really a poppy because it's next right. to other things that it's much larger than now. Um, so part of that is embellished and then, yeah, some of the shaping is embellished as well. Okay, I'm gonna bring up another image here. And, cause I want to also to know, like, do you work from real plants or do you work from pictures? Um, so I work mainly from pictures cause I go for a lot of walks. I'll, I'll look at a lot of botanical il illustrations as well. Um, occasionally I'll bring some plants home or leaves or different items to work from. Um, but I find that I, I'm interested in a lot of plants that I am not normally near. Uh, so it, it is usually, uh, I need the references in order to get the kind of more interesting plants. Well, and you know, I guess, is your house full of plants? I guess we can see some behind you there. Um, and I wondered if you had a favorite plant. <laughs> Um, I do have a favorite plant. It's probably the pearl succulent that I have because it's just a little bit weird. Like it's a, it a bunch of little balls coming off. Um, has it been highlighted at any of your pieces? Pardon? Has it been highlighted at any of your current pieces? You know what? I have not put it in yet, so it might it might make it make I know. it. So it's like. You need to, well, and this is also interesting because I'm going to have to look up this plant now, especially with this like succulent craze that's going on. <laughs> it is pretty neat. I would grab it, but it's in a, it's in a place okay. so far away. I was curious, like I said, because it's, you know, obviously this is, um, you're showcasing all sorts of plants and sometimes it's bits of them. Like in the one we see here, it's like there, are, you know, there's some leaves, um, you know, and then there's this like kind of, fuzzy almost object. I love, I particularly love your brushwork um, in that. It's hard, kind of hard to see in a YouTube or in this Facebook video, but, um, but there's a lot of beautiful kind of detailed line in there. Um, so I want to ask you because again, um, the compositions are interesting. They tend to like, you know, these, these amalgamations tend to kind of float. Um, they're, you know, they're not grounded on the background. Um, so where do these compositions come from? Do you, you know, do you make them up as you go along or do you have kind of a plan um, before you start? Um, I actually make them up as I go along. I find it uh, more interesting to me because then it's more about the relationships that the plants have. Uh, because after I've painted one, then it's like, well, what kind of fits with this? And then sometimes I see like a direction that I want to go in. Um, and with the pieces that I've used ink in, like this one has kind of this brown ink area, uh, it starts off with the ink. Um, so I'll make a shape with ink and then kind of figure out what what's going to be growing out of that shape. So yeah, it's, I never know what's going to happen. And I kind of like cool. that. I used to plan pieces um, and I didn't find it as exciting because I, I knew what was going to happen. So kind right. of the unexpectedness of 
where am I going to go next? Right. Like what, yeah. yeah like a little bunch of flowers or leaves are going to kind of show up. Yeah. No, I like that too. And I kind of get a sense that they, that you're working maybe a little bit intuitively with them, that they're not over planned, which is, you know, what I also like about them, the kind of spontaneity. Um, Heather, do you think, do you feel that uh, if a picture comes out exactly as you planned it, that it was time to move on because it was predictable? I think, yeah, I kind of, I think I get kind of bored while I'm doing it if I know where it's going to end up. Yeah, yeah okay. that adventure. Yeah. That, that's the driver, isn't it? Yeah. The adventure. You really don't, people, you know, people say, well, what are you, what are you going to do next? And you go, gee, I hope I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Sure. Right? laughs> so uh, so artificial intelligence is not for the artist. Oh, sorry, right. Rick. So if you, if you have an algorithm, uh, you're passe. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you, you, come up with an, you come up with a thought or an emotion, right? Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. You were having a lot of fun with this one. I was. This one yeah. was a lot of fun to do. Yeah. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about your palette as well. It's pretty bright and unabashed. Um, and then as we saw earlier, there's like one that is kind of predominantly black and white. So, you know, how do you select your colors? Um, some of the titles um, do reference the color. Um, but yeah, and also tell us about this, like, you know, this black and white one that kind of snuck in. Yeah, for sure. So um, I'm really driven to a lot of brighter colors. I always have been. I'm really uh, drawn to greeny gold colors, which you, you'll see in a lot of right. my pieces. Um, but then I started kind of limiting my palette. The ones, the pieces that reference colors was where I decided to restrict my palette and I, and, and have fun with it and kind of explore what that looked like. Mm -hmm. um, so the predominantly black one um, is, uh, was kind of an interesting thing for me because it wasn't colorful. And you'll see that I did add color in because I, I could not resist. But it's little um, hints. That's <laughs> it. Little, little hints. But um, I kind of wanted to challenge myself to make something that was natural and hopeful, but lacked color. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the fun challenge in that one, was uh, trying to make it bright and lifelike while being very minimal on the color. Just that little and blue. Guess, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, I guess one of my last questions for you, and then, um, Cass and I just want to discuss our favorite pieces um, is because your work often does reference nature taking over, um, which, as I said earlier, is a little bit timely given this current pandemic situation. Do you see this as more of a utopia or a fantasy or a nightmare? Well, actually, the way that I've been thinking about these pieces is as future plants. Like these mm -hmm. are these are plants from the future that have oh, formed okay. together um, to overcome something in a beautiful way. So in a way, yeah, they're they're kind of fantasy pieces because um, they're kind of impossible and unknown. Um, but I, yeah, I do see them as kind of overcoming something. Um, yeah, future plants. Now, Candice, um, I'm going to bring up your favorite piece. Mm -hmm. Um, which we haven't seen an image of yet. So just <clears throat> bear with me while I bring it up. Okay, here we go. So this is Glimpses of Unknown. And when you were also talking about composition, this one seemed really unique um, in the way you've put it together um, in both the negative space you've used, but also how the one is really coming forward the other one's really sort of set back, like you're glimpsing into it. Can you talk about the choices on this piece? Um, so this one was kind of interesting because, uh, unlike the other ones, there's two, two beings that have kind of come together. Right. Um, and I, and I wanted to see what, what that looked like when these amalgamations met, um, each other. Um, and I think the interesting thing is that even though each of them are their own groupings, they look like individuals when they're next to each other. So they become kind of one next to each other, even though they're made up of many parts. Um, yeah, so it was kind of playing with, 
with what happens when these things are, are separated and together. Thank you. And now I'll bring up my favorite piece. Um, tie that one, bring this one in. Little transition here. Um, so this is, and I don't know if I'm gonna be saying it right, but Azurius? Yes. Um, <laughs> it's, it, I don't even know how to properly say okay. it right now, so it's all good. <laughs> I mean, I'm guessing the title does refer obviously to this beautiful blue color that you use. It is very monochromatic. Um, and I particularly love the color composition and brushwork in this one. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this piece? Yeah, so this was actually the first piece that I did where I decided to restrict my palette. Um, I wanted to see what that would look like of, of just using certain tones and slowly throwing in different hints of color. Um, because I found that it, it made it more unusual. It made them more beings and amalgamations because they became kind of one also in the unity of the color. Right. Um, and it also makes them seem otherworldly, but also still known because there's still identifiable, identifiable things in them, but they're right. not the color yeah. that they would normally be. Um, yeah, so it was kind of an experiment as to as to how to embody this color through these plants and also make them one. On this one, the the delicateness, your your, your drawing is so precise, but it's so so delicate, right? <clears throat> so that's a that's a hard thing to do, right? You you want to you want to nail down the image. Right, and you're letting you're you're letting your whatever it is inside dominate this. In that the head is saying and the eyes are saying, "Here's the image," but you're 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 just glancing and gla uh, and touching on uh, the petals a bit with your hand. Yeah, I find it kind of interesting the different emotions and feelings that the different colors would would bring agreed well and i guess for me too is i have to i know i sound like a broken record here facebook friends but um you really cannot appreciate the immense detail in this piece just from our stream so i do encourage you in regards to all of the artworks that we're looking at please jump on our website um there are better images on there so you can kind of get a better sense of like the detail in them um you know or like i said come for a little visit and um, so far also online we're seeing a lot of response to your pieces they're being i know people are loving the people color. are loving them yeah yeah the exactly. color the movement I see that. Um, there's very positive feedback so thank you thank you facebook friends um <laughs> so now we're going to move on to some questions for you rick um I'll get the first question going and then I'll switch out our image. Um, now, I know there in this body of work, there are different series. Um, can you, you know, tell us about these different series and how do you distinguish them from each other? The groupings of, <clears throat> of timely thoughts or emotions or ideas. <clears throat> so, sorry. Uh, uh, for example, on on that one, I wa I called that the kitchen sink series, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and and it's easy to to take a unified handling of a, a, a single predictable color <laughs> and a single subject matter, and then carry it from top to bottom, side to side, right? The trick is how do you get all of these different ideas on one page? And how do you bridge? So that one was uh, my one of my favorites of that period. But I worked on I don't know forty. I'm looking at Laura, forty pieces in that vein, and and uh, so I would I would come up with a, a handling, a shape, and then I would take it over to another and and ask the picture, what do you want now? Do you have waves of where you're using a particular media? Like where you really fall in love with those ink lines or where you're really wanting to use paint? 
Do you go through stages that way? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes, sometimes I'll start with a, a media or a mark. Oh, that one. Uh, that one was for Laura. These ones, are these like <laughs> jewelry? Because I know there are some that you refer to as jewelry and some that you refer to as kind of like architecture. I mean, yeah. these ones, again, the viewers can't really see, but there's kind of a really beautiful um, like texture going on in that in that, you know, kind of that blue shape. Um, and there is a little bit of a, you know, a metallic feel to it as well. A but, luster, yeah. Mm -hmm. The handling on that one was was a lot of fun. What I did was I started with a, a drawing structure, okay? And so under each of those dots is part of a, a grid that I, I did Whoa. for that piece. And then the grid became line works. So I had this really strong architectural engineering structure, and then it needed uh, it needed tiers. So in this particular one, I knew I was going to end up with the blue, but the blue was going to be the the finishing part of it. So I I went in with the other colors, and in order to make it to make the blue operate, that one has a ton of of masking on, under it. So I, I did, I don't know, I don't count, but I did hundreds of, of dots until I had a snowstorm and uh, outer space on a grid. And then, then at that point, I stopped making the dots. I, I created the color. Um, I, most of my colors are mixed. Right. And then uh, I, needed, I needed to go into that and I left the delicate pen and I went into that with my hands. So uh, the paint came out of the tube and onto my fingers and, uh, and I just kept working it and working it wet, wet, wet until the picture said, okay, stop now. Well, and that actually no. another question I have about these is is the color. So, what is behind the colors you use? Are they to create an emotional response, or are the colors supposed to be more playful? Like, tell us a little bit about your color choices. I believe that drawing is is thought, and color is emotion. So, in this particular grouping. Um, uh, in creating that color, I wanted a dark color because it was Laura's tears, right? Um, problems in New York uh, scared her, and so what I what I did was I just I said, okay, uh, Laura likes metal, right? She's a big fan of Klimt, and and so I said, this is for you, Laura, and so I put in some metal and I mixed in. Uh, a specific color that that is Laura's favorite, and so that one went from from my mind to my heart to to my wife. Right. Well, and I guess um, you know maybe you can talk about um, the titles a little bit too, because you've got some really unique titles. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Well, okay, so there's one, and I have to bring it up, but it's called Organizing Risk and Complexity Just by <laughs> yeah. Hello, Phil. There's a guy, Phil Tompkins. Uh, he wrote about managing risk and complexity through communication. He created the communication system for the rocketry program for Von Braun at NASA. Oh. Okay. And so... So uh, there was a lot of fun there. There was a lot of outer space. I don't right. know if that okay. one was in that one. But yeah, yeah. So yeah, risk and complexity, emotion and intellect, always trying to, to not balance them, but to, to have equal weight. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll take a, like in this one, while we're waiting for the next one, that lower green dot, was to have a lot of visual weight and it was to carry that blue to bring you back to okay okay this isn't just a joke 
right? It's okay. how, I make, how I make my circles. Uh, it, it all depends on the day, right? Uh, I want okay, to I'm surprise gonna, myself. I'm going to bring up this one now, too, sure. <clears throat> um, which is <laughs> called um, Homage to a Cyclist Pace Line. And this is my personal favorite. This is Candace's favorite. Yeah, indeed. A big well, I, also, I really identify with that ivory ovoid at the bottom corner. That's usually where I am in yeah. my run. But a, with this one, I, you have such a distinction between the ink line and the hatching, and then that big swath of dense paint. Do you do these at different times when you're in different moods, or is this a singular piece that you have done in one sitting? This was a series I did when I was returning to bicycling. Uh, you know, uh, at a certain stage, we we choose. We can either choose to drink, we can choose to to do dope, we can choose to do, to leave our jobs and our families. And I chose my addiction carefully. I chose road bicycling. Well, there you go. And so, and so I got deeply involved in it. I well, I ended up riding from, well, not from. I ended up riding uh, 515 kilometers in a day, just to see wow. if I could do it. And so there was this big deal race in Europe. It's called Perry Roubaix, and they race across cobblestones, and they have to race along the side of the road because the middle is so bad. This this is where they hauled cannons for or uh, through okay. Europe, Napoleon. And these guys have to line up and they're going incredibly fast. And they they slipstream on each other. They're all in different colors. And the crash, and I mean crash, break bikes in half. <laughs> yes, I think and, everyone is watching. Seen that. Sorry, it's in Belgium, that race is in Belgium. And so if you fall off your bike, they have three people. One person gets you up, another person grabs the bike, and a third helps the other person, puts you back on the bike, and they push you back in the race. There's no quitting unless you break something really important. So, so uh, this is these these people going along in a in a in the ditch. But so after I did, but what about the working of your materials? Oh, that too. Well, that big slab is is pavement, right? It's just there, and it's massive. But for the moment, the the jelly beans you called them. Uh, oh, I know. That's what I nicknamed them. Yeah. Jelly beans. And I'm okay with that. Okay. <laughs> uh, they could also be I'm a very food oriented person. <laughs> I have nicknames, so. I, it was as much, I hope it's as much fun to look at as it is to see. If you also notice the color I chose, it's it's kind of pastel because that race invariably is in the rain and you right. don't get you don't get to see these things. And so there's that whole idea going down the left side and how do you balance that off? And the choice I made was that gash on the lower lower right where I said, look, these things are leaning this piece sorry, in that direction, right? They're, they're putting there, there's the weight. So how do we get right balance over here? And that, you can't see my hand, but I think you that's that gash in there. And, and it just seemed right, sorry, sorry. That's okay, we're always gonna talk over each other a little bit. Um, Cause we're all in different places. So we don't, <laughs> the, the, you know, we don't have like the, as to those uh, kind of like those social graces that we do when we're in person. Um, yeah. okay, I'm going to bring up mine. I my think for yourself, I don't have many social graces. <laughs> you do so. <laughs> I'm okay, an so artist. My favorite, which okay. is um, one of the titles that I mentioned earlier, because um, this is the organizing risk and complexity by just listening, um, and I really enjoy various parts of this piece. Um, I like the tight and controlled hatching. Um, and then there's some kind of like looser line work uh, at areas as well. I like that there's these flat color areas um, with a more organic kind of gorgeous orange 
blob. Um, I know that's not art speak, yeah. but it's like that yeah, big cool. shape, I really yeah. like the haze of it. Um, I love the color of it. I love, um, so I guess what, what does the title mean in relation to this work and how does listening play a part in your drawing or does it? I wish I could, could listen better, okay. but uh, the, the piece talks to you, right? Um, the guy who was behind that title, Phil Tompkins, uh, and the guy who sent me to Phil, a guy named Jim Barker, who's a big deal management writer and thinker out of Dalhousie. Um, uh, they got me thinking about how complexity and risk is managed. And it's, it's not the items, but how they're joined, how they're bridged that mattered to me. So, so um, I laid down uh, the hatching and I drew and drew and drew on it. I created structure with the lines and kept going. And then, then the piece said, uh, you, you've got to try something else, right? We're, we're too much the same. And so I went back in with uh, colors and I picked colors that, that really put me off, that I found just offsetting. And that's the risk. Okay. Now and then you, to, you just lay it down and, and you hope. And then, oh, then there's the, the one allusion to outer space is the little earth right there in the lower right, right corner. Right. I've uh, propped it up on two, on two uh, uh, what? What, 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 what am I looking for? On two legs, okay? okay? And that's the planet Earth. And so, so hello, NASA. This, you know, this is Apollo 13 here, right? And so, yeah, that one was really, I, I almost trashed it. And Laura said, I'm go fix it, go fix it, go fix yeah, it. Yeah, no, I'm glad you didn't because it is, I think it's one of my favorites. I really do kind of really? like orange and yellow are kind of favorite colors to me. And I just love this, like oh. I said, the combination of, you know, the tight hatched areas and the loose hatched areas. Um, so yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing this body of work with us, both of you. Um, and I guess I'm looking at the time and it went a little longer than I thought we would. So thank you, Facebook friends, for we'll hanging in there with us. Yeah. Um, um, and you know, in wrap up. I, oh, what's, go ahead. Let me jump in. Uh, okay. Friends, um, this is not a charity. The plight of the artist is not poor and desperate. Uh, Christine is in business. She, <laughs> she creates art, she sells it, and she sells it for a reasonable amount. You'll find my prices are pretty good and they're a little higher than when I used to sell them out of the back seat of my car and I'm good with that. And so, so uh, don't do her a favor and don't do me a favor. There is good quality work there. You should look at it. And, and very honestly, I don't, I don't need the money personally, uh, but uh, I put my faith in Christine starting how long ago? Five years? Six? Quite a while ago. I well, think you were fairly new in that location. When did Sorry. And and yeah, Candace, Candace, Candace uh, four my years. stuff would be sorry to to go on, but my stuff would be worthless if Candace hadn't add va added value. And so their eyes, their eyes uh, led to this show. They kept telling me, you know, go back and and do something that that's worth showing. Well, and we've so, seen a huge so, development in your work, and you know, and. It's so we're we're thrilled to have it, and, and Rick's absolutely right. They are very good price points. I mean, he's been working on this series for a very long time, um, but they are these, you know, small, delicate, little, beautiful paper pieces. 
Um, and paperworks generally are a good starting point for collectors because the price points are lower. Um, so I'll do a little plug again for the gallery in our buy art section. We do have prices online there, um, but Rick's prices for this series typically range from about 250 unframed to $500 like unframed. And then the frame is approximately kind of like 100, 125, I think on that. Um, but you will find those prices online. If you have any questions at all um, about the bodies of work, you can reach out to us via social media, give us a call, like um, email us, um, you know, back to Heather. Um, we have like, of course, her pieces, we have sold one, um, but her price points range from, are similarly from like kind of that 375 unframed up to 750 unframed. Um, and, you know, with Heathers, we don't have a lot of them framed um, because framing is very specific. With Rick, we did kind of make some choices, um, but the framing can be framed to your taste too. Nothing has to be as it is. Um, but please have a look online. Like I said, we have lots of information on there about the bodies of work, about these artists that you've learned so much more about today. Um, and don't be a stranger to the gallery. Um, we are. We are always open at christineclassengallery.com. We're happy um, to take some appointments. We're happy to take appointments. Our frame shop is still going strong. So, you know, maybe you have some framing projects too. Um, we'd love to work with you. Uh, what else can I say? Um, the place is amazing, people. Thank you. you. We're very lucky, indeed. Yeah. Thanks to both of you as well for joining us. Um, today and thanks again to everybody who tuned in for our long-winded mm -hmm. but very informative Q&A. Um, I think we did a pretty good job considering um, you know this is kind of very very new and scary. <laughs> and congratulations. Heather, you did it. You, you do good work. I'm, I'm, it's I'm beautiful, really beautiful happy work. To, to be in the same room as your stuff at the same time. You're you're good. You're good. She's good. <laughs> <laughs> and without um me and that's it we're gonna sign off so thanks again hopefully we'll um do this again in the future thanks again to um rick and heather for joining us and thanks to candace for you know guests mediating this with us thank you all we look forward to your comments thank you thank you good night bye bye